Hi, I'm Beth Quinn from NCWIT. In this video on retention, you'll learn techniques for retaining students and computing majors. In this introductory video, we're going to explore why implementing specific practices to help retain women are both necessary and important. Retention just means once you get the students in your major, how do you keep them there? It's a natural follow-up to our discussion of recruiting, and it's a necessary component to a smart strategic plan. If you can't keep the students you recruit, what's the point? In this video, we're going to explore how stereotypes about computing can affect retention of certain students. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stereotype threat and technical privilege, and we're going to do a brief introduction to the NCWIT Engagement Practices Framework. And this framework is what we're going to use um, in subsequent sections of this retention module. Let's begin with something that affects both the recruitment and retention of all kinds of students to computing. Most people really don't know what computing is about. Unless you have somebody close to you who's in computing, what you know tends to reflect what you've seen in the media. And those images can be skewed. They tell a particular story, and that story is often not very compelling for a lot of people. So let's explore that uh, in a bit more depth. We're going to look at some images about computing in the media, including who does computing, what the work looks like, and how the environment is portrayed. I'm going to go kind of fast, but the objective is just to get you thinking. We'll finish this section by looking at some research on the topic. So, first slide. This is the uh, central class uh, cast of the HBO show Silicon Valley. And then here are some images uh, that came up with the search term programmer. Think about the demographics of the people, what they're doing, who they're doing it with or not, and the types of environments they're in. And what does this humorous kind of meme <laughs> say about what computing work is like? What are the hours like or the expectations of the work? Here are two images that came up when I put in the search term genius programmer. Here's another meme from that same search, um, and it uh, explicitly ties um, masculinity uh, to the notion of programming and beard length or facial hair. And then just a check it out, I put programmers and masculinity as search terms, and I came up with this meme, that it, these three memes that explicitly make a connection between programming and what you might call hyper-masculinity. Here's a full screen capture of the results of a search for images of computer scientists. And here's another full screen capture for a search on computer science. What message is being sent about what the work might look like? How many people, for example, are in these images? So if all you know about computing comes from popular media, what would you assume about who does computing, what the work is like, and where and how the work happens? Research on stereotypes about computing tend to show that people assume that people who do it are geeks and nerds, they're unsociable or awkward socially, and that the work and motivations for the work are individualistic and competitive, and that men do this work and are quote-unquote naturally better at it than women. And children pick up on these stereotypes early. A recent study, for example, of first graders by Allison Masters and her colleagues found that both girls and boys alike thought that boys were better at programming and robots. These are first graders. Master also notes how persistent these early form stereotypes can be. And she writes, stereotypes can get inside our heads in subtle ways. When you see a computer scientist on television or in a book, it's usually a man, probably a white man or an Asian man. Every little instance of that builds up into these big stereotypes inside our heads. To counteract them is very, very difficult. And these stereotypes have real impact. They can actually affect the performance of individuals who are subject to the stereotype. 
This is called stereotype threat. The idea is that the risk of confirming the stereotype creates anxiety and takes up cognitive resources leading to poor performance. If the stereotype is highlighted before a task, your performance may be affected negatively by stereotype threat. So situational factors more than individual personality or other characteristics can strengthen or weaken the stereotype threat effect. And the, the graph that's shown in this slide is kind of typical of the way in which these studies are done. Uh, you have uh, two or more conditions. Um, so one condition is where this, this stereotype is not made salient. And in this case, it's before they took the math test, um, the students were told that there was no gender difference found on this test. And then in the experimental condition, they were told before taking the math test that the test usually produces a gender difference and it's the same test, right? And you can see from these results that uh, when the stereotype about uh, gender differences is highlighted, and the stereotype is that men are better at math than women, men's performance uh, is slightly better and perhaps more importantly, women's performance is depressed. These studies have been done with women in math, girls in math, uh, just looked at the difference between low and high socioeconomic backgrounds on intellectual tasks, men compared to women on social sensitivity, where the positive or um, stereotype is toward women being more socially sensitive and, and men's performance can uh, be suppressed with the stereotype. Whites compared with Asian men in mathematics, whites with regard to appearing racist, and whites compared with blacks and Hispanics on tasks assumed to reflect natural sports ability. Another interesting uh, kind of trend in these studies is that the effect of stereotype threat tends to be stronger among students who, one, want to, to perform well. So your motivated students are more likely to be subject to stereotype threat. And then two, uh, people who are more strongly identified with the stereotype group uh, tend to have a stronger stereotype threat effect. So consider this. How might stereotype threat be activated for women and others who are underrepresented in computing simply by the demographics of the students in their courses? This graph represents the distribution of associate's degrees, the top two bars, and bachelor's degrees, the lower two bars, from U.S. colleges in 2017. The top bar in each set is the percentage of men broken down by race, ethnicity. The second bar is the percentage of women also by race, ethnicity, and the two bars in a set adds up to 100%. So you can see that white men, represented by the teal-colored portions, are way overrepresented at both levels of computing degrees. So when a student walks into a typical introductory computing course, they're likely to have those stereotypes about who, about who does computing, at least demographically, reinforced simply by who's in the room. So let's consider another side of this story. Philip, Philip Guo, wrote a blog in 2014, and he began it by describing this picture. Quote, this was me at nine years old with horrible posture. I started programming when I was five, first with Logo and then Basic. By the time this photo was taken, I'd already written several Basic games that I distributed as shareware on our local BBS. I was fast growing bored, so my parents, both software engineers, gave me the original Dragon compiler textbook from their grad school days. So he goes on in this blog with this description of his precociousness in computing. So what's your reaction? I mean, I thought, wow, what a prodigy. You know, he looks like he's, he's destined to become a computer scientist. The only thing is, it's completely made up. He goes on in the blog to tell us that he didn't even know how to touch type when this photo was taken, let, it go, let alone program anything that it's so easy for people to believe this story is what Guo calls technical privilege. And he goes on to recount ways that this has played out in his life through college, in an internship, and into the workplace. When he's in front of a computer, people just assume he knows what he's doing, even though sometimes he doesn't. The privilege he has is that he can easily fake it till he makes it 
but others who do not fit the stereotype don't have this privilege. Guo ends his blog with this thought experiment. For every white or Asian male expert programmer you know, imagine a parallel universe where they were of another ethnicity and or gender, but had the exact same initial interest and aptitude levels. Would they still have been willing to devote the over 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to achieve mastery in the face of dozens or hundreds of instances of implicit discouragement they will inevitably encounter over the years. Sure, some super resilient outliers would, but many wouldn't. Many of us would quit, even though we had the potential and the interest to thrive in this field. You can think of it this way. Stereotype threat and technical privilege are two sides of the same coin. So the same classroom environment is not the same, depending on who you are. In subsequent sections of this module, we're going to explore specific techniques that you can use to disrupt stereotype threat, challenge the stereotypes, and expand students' ideas about what computing really is about. There are techniques of ways that I like to think about of helping make computing stick for students who may not see themselves in computing, for students who may, because of stereotypes, uh, easily slide right out um, of the major in the profession. So let's end with an introduction to the framework that we're going to use to do this. The NCWIT Engagement Practices Framework organizes research on retaining students from groups that have been historically underrepresented in computing and organizes it around three principles. Make it matter, grow inclusive student community, and build student confidence and professional identity. But let's underscore something here. We're not saying that underrepresented students inherently need special curricula, pedagogy, or support. All of these principles are great for all students. They really just describe great teaching. But what we want to understand is, and what we want to explore, is how in turn each of these principles can work to help retain students who may not see themselves in computing. So first, make it matter. To make it matter simply means connecting the material in computing to things that students already know about or are interested in. In doing this, you build a kind of cognitive and emotional net and increase the likelihood that students will remain interested in the major even in the face of stereotypes about who does it. Second, research suggests that students are more likely to persist in college if they have a community, and this is true of anyone. But by intentionally acting to grow community among your students in your computing program, you'll improve the experience of all the students in the major and increase the likelihood that you'll build a diverse student body. Lastly, we'll introduce you to some techniques for building student confidence and professional identity. As we've seen, because of stereotypes around computing, students from groups that are traditionally underrepresented may be subject to stereotype threat. This can manifest as a seeming lack of confidence or underperformance. There are ways, however, to mitigate stereotype threat and build confidence by, for example, providing effective encouragement and modeling a growth mindset. Also, by teaching all students norms of professionalism, you can interrupt ways that students themselves may reinforce stereotypes and exclude others. We'll cover all of these ideas in more depth in subsequent sections of this retention module. I'm Beth Quinn for NCWIT, and I hope this introduction to some of the concepts underlying NCWIT's approach to retention has been helpful. Thank you.